see this crowd torn apart. This is Haiti and people are like in a battle trance. I don't know. They're smashing everything around them. No one is afraid of the armed police. Defending government buildings here is clearly not that simple. Look, for instance, this police car has no windshield, as if they've removed it to shoot directly from inside the cabin. They've reinforced the bumpers with metal structures to smash other things. And break through barricades, just chaos. All this is happening on the streets of the capital city. Porto Prince, there you go. It has come to the point that the bandits in Haiti have seized the main airport in the country and closed it. They set fire to several police stations and stormed two prisons, releasing 4,000 criminals, some bandits, damn if I know what they were sitting there for. At the same time, the police are paralyzed. You see people, if they want to ask for help, they don't call 911 in Haiti now, they call the radio so that someone can hear them, come and help them in any way possible. The death toll is already in the tens. It's impossible to say exactly how many people have died. Today we will try to figure out what happened in this small country, who sees power in it and what will happen next. This is Lyadov and how people live or rather survive in Haiti. This is a new assault by armed gangs who control much of our country's capital, the capital of Haiti, Port-au-Prince. Port-au-Prince and its surroundings are set ablaze. Police officers and hundreds of people have been killed. The gangs have set fire and destroyed police stations, as well as public and private buildings. You will hear this voice over more than once today. We found someone who agreed to show us life in Haiti today, as it truly is, but he will stay behind the scenes. And I can't even tell you his name because journalists are simply killed here for filming on the streets. In the last three years, at least five journalists have been killed here for trying to investigate the crimes of thugs. One of the recent incidents involved Dumeski Carson photographing the site of another gunfight when some man approached him and demanded his photos. When he refused, he was simply shot in the head. Haiti is now third after Syria and Somalia on the list of most dangerous places for journalists to work, particularly because attacks on them are not investigated. But specifically for the People Channel, this brave man agreed to go out onto the street with a camera to interview local residents. We were ambushed by bandits. It was terrifying. I had to kneel before them. Then they made me sit down. They spotted a few guys nearby, pointed their guns at them and said, join our fight or we'll kill you right here. This lawlessness is not happening somewhere in a back alley or behind garages. It's in the very center of the city, right opposite the presidential palace. The criminals made this woman kneel and threatened young men right here. I was able to escape from these bandits and tried to hide in a school building where there were many other people. Then the police came and kicked us out. There were constant gunshots in the street. I didn't know where to go and wandered around. I had several bags in my hands, all my things, my tears I couldn't even wipe away. I didn't understand what was happening. I was crying all the time. In the end, some motorcyclists picked me up and dropped me off here. During the next escalation, peaceful people, predominantly women and children, are trying to escape from the city on foot. Tent camps are growing outside the capital, where everyone hauls what they can. Look at a man with a carpet. We'll only sleep on it under the open sky for the upcoming weeks, maybe even a month. Buckets, umbrellas, canisters. People bring everything that could help them survive. The refugees pass by the message on the wall. All people are equal, which in such conditions looks simply sarcastic. Are you saying that your house burned down completely? Yes, completely. I couldn't save anything. My son also lost everything. He really lost everything. I have neither money nor clothes. 
organizations are recording my name and data, but I haven't received anything yet. We used to get hot food, but we haven't received anything for several days. I'm with my daughter in this camp. She went to get me hot food, but apparently she hasn't found anything yet because she hasn't returned. Have you lost any family members in a bandit attack in your area? No, I haven't lost any family or close friends. Only our house. It was completely destroyed. Bandits are building barricades, blocking off the streets, and even throwing garbage onto the roads to make it more difficult for the police to pass through. Look at this, the police are hurling tear gas grenades at the protesters and the entire street is filled with stinging smoke, but the crowd is refusing to disperse. Here, notice this man standing and giving out water to everyone who has breathed in the gas. The police aren't driving them away. It's obvious they are frightened of the crowd and have lost control of the situation. Yes, I am aware that armed men do a lot of damage to the populace, but we must forgive them for the sake of building a different Haiti. This guy with the machine gun being filmed on camera is speaking like a seasoned politician. He's literally holding real power in the streets of Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Just observe how confident he is. He's posing for the camera, giving interviews, and he's got three machine gunners as bodyguards, a genuine resistance leader. If we don't forgive, and if we don't accept our guilt. I believe the society will never change. This man's name is Jimmy Barbecue. Do you know why he's got that alias? It's because his favorite hobby is blocking doors and setting his enemies' houses on fire, so they burn to death inside. Now his next target is the country's prime minister. If Ariel Henry does not step down, we are looking at genocide. If the international community continues to back Henry, then we are headed straight towards a civil war. While the Prime Minister and the Police Chief are hiding from gangsters in Puerto Rico, gangsters here are not afraid to speak on camera and show their faces. Because in case they, for instance, don't like how journalists portrayed them, the journalists will simply be killed. Two years ago, two reporters from a local radio station went to record an interview with one of the gang leaders. The gangster gave an interview and later the men were found killed, their bodies burned. Burning the bodies of the murdered, it's like a national thing in Haiti because locals believe in the existence of zombies who burn killed people, so they don't suddenly rise up, don't return and don't avenge. Seriously, voodoo cults are very reverent in Haiti. Haiti. This is likely the most impoverished country in this region of the world. It is quite small and it is situated between North and South America. In the capital, there are just under a million people. The important detail that sets Haiti apart from any place on earth is that here there are about 200 different gangs constantly dividing cities, neighborhoods, districts, every corner of the street among themselves. And of course, this affects the lives of ordinary people. Take a look at this map. Now that's what I call Haiti. And here are the territories that are managed and controlled by gangs. Holy shit, man. And of course, they have their own constant Game of Thrones among themselves. But the most interesting thing is that all these gangs were actually raised by the government. Because back in the 60s, there was this little family called the Duvaliers ruling here. Duvalier, the elder, led the country to a state where even in the kitchen, people were too scared to criticize him. If a rival ever tried to dethrone him, he wouldn't simply kill him but would keep his head in the closet for life. In summary, Duvalier, this dictator, started by getting an education in America and then came to Haiti and decided to seize power. In the elections, he initially achieved 99 and 9 tenths percent and then he simply declared himself lifelong president. But it turned out he wasn't going to stop there. Soon he declared himself a deity on earth and even paraphrased the Lord's Prayer so that people should glorify him in the temples, not Jesus Christ and his father, but dictator Duvalier. Moreover, there is a very prevalent belief in evil spirits in Haiti, particularly the voodoo cult. So here's Duvalier. He capitalized on this, claiming he could resurrect the dead, turn them into zombies, and people believed him. To play the part of an evil spirit, he even changed his voice and would only whisper. De Boris was persuasive enough to convince everyone that he had the power to kill the American president with his dark magic. In 1961, John F. Kennedy made the decision to stop financial aid to the country, which incidentally went directly into the president's pocket. We're talking about a sum of $15 million a year. Honestly, Duvalier was simply siphoning all international aid into his personal accounts in addition to borrowing millions from other countries and also transferring that to himself. So when the Americans ceased providing funds, 
Duvalier cursed Kennedy and began to stick pins into his doll. Then of course everyone laughed at him, but six weeks after this ritual, Kennedy was shot. And so in order to quietly kill those who disagreed with their policy and to keep all the opposition in fear, they made flying death squads. Here they were called Tonton Makut, a character from local folklore who kidnapped naughty children. These guys had their own uniforms, sunglasses, denim shirt. At first, they acted secretly, but year after year, their actions became louder and more demonstrative. It got to the point where they stoned their victims right in the squares. They burned people alive and threw the bodies right in the street so that others would be a They sold people's bodies for organs abroad. All citizens were required to become donors. Every two months, 2,000 liters of blood were shipped from Haiti to the United States. Between 1958 and 1986, Duvalier's henchmen killed between 30,000 and 60,000 people, according to various data. Duvalier was overthrown in 1986, but no one disarmed the Makuts, and they turned into gangs, which today have grown into the main political force of the country and are actively fighting not only with the police, but also with each other. Schools and government buildings are presently closed. The area is calm now, but in front of commercial buildings, especially before banks and petrol stations, we can observe a long line of people waiting. Some are trying to stock up just in case the situation escalates. The head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, one of the few international organizations still able to operate in Haiti, told us about the current situation in the country. The humanitarian crisis is a multi-dimensional one. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is a reality of uh, the, uh, the Haitian uh, people. Five million people out of 11 million uh, which is the total number of the population in the country, and peaks of recurrent emergency crisis uh, that exacerbate. The streets are jammed with cars and look at these clunkers. It feels like they've already lived through the apocalypse. Bank buildings more resemble impregnable fortresses featuring high fences and window grills. We go further. It seems like an ordinary house, but the windows are barricaded with metal sheets, a fence three times the height of a human, and there's even an electrically charged coil on top. They're clearly prepping for a raid. Bandits attacked the largest prison in the country. 400 criminals managed to escape. Only 100 were recaptured. As a consequence, now gangs rule. 80% of Haiti's capital territory. And what shocks us the most is people here indeed back the criminals and partake in their demonstrations. We are here to support any protester who opposes the trampling of our rights. We head to that side. When institutions that appear to follow the law enslave the population. Maybe it's the Stockholm Syndrome, of course, when you just support strong people with machine guns who come to your street and walk around here and you somehow start to think that you support them. Or people don't see the difference between politicians and gangsters, for example. Jimmy Barbecue, it turns out, used to work in the police. Haiti is likely the most unlucky country in the world, as it all began in the 15th century. The Spaniards were the initial arrivals. So it was like the era of colonization. They were just grabbing land. So the Spaniards arrived and didn't understand what to do with this land. They just want there to be more of her, but the local population started dying out from the diseases that the Spaniards brought here because they didn't have immunity to tuberculosis, typhoid, or even a common cold yet. The Spaniards did not see the potential for development here and switched their attention to South America, so the French who replaced them turned around here. Their colony, which was called Saint-Domingue, became one of the most profitable among all the conquered lands of France. Cotton, cocoa, sugar and coffee brought incredible profits. At one point, more than half of the world's coffee was grown on GTN plantations and 40% of French sugar was also produced here. About a third of the most luxurious palace in the world at the time, Versailles, was built by Louis XVI with money from the sale of what was grown in Gate. And here comes the logical question. If the local population has practically died out, then where do we get people to work on all these plantations, factories and so on? The French recently made the foolish decision to import individuals from Africa to this location from their French colonies. This is the reason why Haiti continues to speak French. 
More precisely, he calls it some kind of French Haitian because it's not classical French, they call it Creole language. It's like a mix of French and Spanish. Well, it's kind of like Central America. So at one point, the slaves revolted. Their revolt was successful. This was the first time such happened. In January 1804, local slaves took down the colonizers and started to govern themselves. A former slave known as Jean-Jacques Dessalines declared himself emperor. Then three years later, his subordinates killed him. Ever since, killing their leaders has somehow become a routine in Haiti. Haiti's entire 200-year history of independence is a chain of coups and revolutions. The second problem was their Dominican neighbors, who senselessly massacred 20,000 in 1937. Furthermore, in 2010, an earthquake tore through the country, killing 200,000 people. Look at this road. This is the very heart of the capital. The earthquake was a quarter century ago, mates, but the road hasn't been repaired by anyone till now. Even the presidential palace is yet to be restored. We are all tired. Help people. Support them. Show kindness and compassion. Political bickering then turned into a massive disaster. In 2011, normal elections took place and everything was relatively calm until 2021. Then, Javanel Mois, the president, was slain in his residency and the chaos unleashed. What's going on in the country right now is a consequence of the events of 2021. A few days before his death, President Moise was able to appoint a new Prime Minister, Ariel Henry. At the beginning of 2024, Henry realizes that the situation is not just at a stalemate, it's completely out of control. Bandon couldn't win, people are starving, which means they're extremely unhappy. And you know what he does? This is just unbelievable. It's like some kind of Game of Thrones. He's flying to the other side of the planet, to Kenya, that's Africa, to buy himself an army, bring it there, to Haiti, and wipe out his opponents. Holy shit! And what do you think? Do the local gangsters surrender? Hell no! They start burning bonfires together with this Jimmy barbecue, and it's just an absolute blast. While political bandits are dividing power, it's the ordinary people who are suffering as usual. Humanitarian organizations are trying to break into the country, but so far they have been unsuccessful. We are supporting the only two operational hospitals um, in the affected area receiving wounded by firearms. So we provide medical items to those uh, uh, hospitals because they run out of uh, medical um, components uh, and for us it, it's important that they are able to continue receiving those wounded. You might ask what's next? Well the situation remains unclear, there's a state of emergency and a curfew in place. The capital of Haiti is almost entire in the hands of local armed gangs. The country's prime minister, Ariel Henry, remains in a foreign country. In neighboring Puerto Rico, seems like he's realized that it's necessary to negotiate. He stated that he'll relinquish power once the transitional council is established. Example of another country, Ecuador, which is also nearby and where similar terrible events happened not long ago when the mafia rebelled, there were many robberies, murders, bloodshed and so on. So they were able to suppress the rebellion there, but whether they will be able to do it in Haiti is a big question. After all, Haiti is an island. And of course, it is easier to behave recklessly on it than on the mainland, where individuals from various countries can enter through land borders. So while Mr. Barbecue continues his party, 